Hello, beloveds, and welcome to Christian Emotional Recovery, a podcast for those who are survivors of childhood trauma, emotional neglect, and narcissistic abuse. This podcast is hosted by Rachel Leroy, a college professor and trauma survivor. Many of us spend years trying to heal and don't get anywhere. We don't always target the trauma itself, which is so often what keeps us stuck. This podcast is where faith meets science. Rachel is an emotional healing expert with 20 years of experience applying healing modalities that helped her start making progress after nothing else worked. She'll show you how to do the same. Each week, we'll cover a topic that will show you how to heal trauma for good. Please check out our website and show notes at christianemotionalrecovery.com and join the Facebook community, Trauma Survivors Unite Christian Emotional Recovery. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Season 3, Episode 10 of Christian Emotional Recovery. But the title of this episode was Integrating Our Faith and Our Practice on the Healing Journey. And today, I am going to speak whatever God puts on my heart. Like I said, most episodes or more episodes I have, I put, I have a specific theme in mind and I create an outline, and I have sources, or at least I have an outline. And sometimes I just hit record, I don't know what I'm going to say, and I let God put it on my heart, and that's what I'm doing today. Other times I'll have a theme, but I still don't know what I'm going to say. And um, I just wanted to talk to you about this whole journey of having, how do we combine our faith, how do we integrate our faith, in with our healing journey and better yet how do we integrate our healing journey in with our faith that is something that can be sometimes controversial it's something that can be it can be complicated in some ways but i think that sometimes it can get over complicated if that makes sense but i know that those of you that are listening the majority of you you're either allies and friends of trauma survivors and you're trying to figure out how you can help maybe your daughter or your son or your mother or your father, a sibling, a friend, a significant other, a spouse, and you're trying to figure out how you can help them on this journey. And if you're listening to the podcast for that, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for believing their stories and validating them. Thank you for supporting them and thank you for taking the time to educate yourself as well to help them on this healing journey. You don't know how much it means to them and how much it means to all of us because there are so many of us that don't have support on this journey and or we're scared to reach out and or people may try to understand but they just don't. You know, there's those people too and we have to give them credit for at least having an open mind to try. But there are very few people who are willing to try to really do the work and wrap their minds around becoming trauma-informed for somebody that they love or being trauma-informed in the field that they work in. If you're a school teacher, for example, especially if you work with young kids, being trauma-informed is everything. If you work in the medical field, being trauma-informed is everything. And this is just my opinion, but if you work in therapy, like emotional healing, any therapies of that, and you're not trauma-informed, you need to become trauma-informed or you have no business, no business working in the field. That is the foundation of the majority of the issues that we have. And that's why therapy would help people. In some cases, it healed people, yes. But people would go to therapy for years and not make much progress. They would make some. And I can tell you that from my own experience, that I went to therapy for years. And yes, it helped me. It gave me relief. It gave me somebody to talk to. It healed certain things. Yeah, it was helpful. But not having that trauma component was everything. And once I got that, my healing that I um, experienced, probably I had as much healing in thir- three years as I did the 20 years before that of trying to heal. It's absolutely mind-boggling. It's amazing. And 
So this whole um, concept of being trauma-informed, and, you know, like I said, the whole point of this podcast is not to obsess over trauma. It's not to wallow in our experiences. It's not to stay in the past. The process of healing is what this podcast is all about. It's about educating you. It's about empowering you. It's about teaching you that you can heal. It's difficult. There will be times you wonder if you're even healing on this journey, but you are if you keep at it and if you keep reprogramming your mind and coming back to the roots source of your traumas. If you're gentle with yourself, if you take it one day at a time, if you're consistent in your daily practice, if you do something, if not every day, then several days a week consistently and keep trying new things and keep pushing into new territories, you will heal. And coming back to what I was talking about is how do we combine or integrate our faith with our healing journey And a lot of people think that those are two different things. And I have mixed feelings about that because there is Christian practice and then there is something that more people would call spirituality. And I think that there's, you know, it also depends on what your background is in terms of religious belief. Um, Even in this podcast, we have, I have people that are Jewish. I have people that are non-believers and they're welcome here too. Um, Of course, I would love to see everybody come to know Christ, but my job is to love everybody where they're at unconditionally, no matter what, and to bring acceptance. There might be groups where we need to talk about, we need to go back to Jesus, we need to get back to being this way, Um, we're getting off the path here. And there is a certain, there are guardrails that I put on this podcast that we don't go beyond, okay? That is true, and we need that, that's biblical. But the emphasis of people who have been abused, sometimes by religious people in religious communities, and even by Christians, and even people that call themselves devout Christians, is so widespread that a lot of people have been hurt in church, and by church, and by religious people, that they don't want anything to do with church, and they don't want anything to do with um, organized religion, and I understand that. I want you to know that it is optimal to find a good church, whether it's in person or online. But if you can't, or if you don't, or if you're in a healing place where you're not able to do that, if there's any way that you can find sustenance and community so that you can connect with other Christians, then do that. And I cannot say that this podcast is a substitute for church or for assembling or connecting with other Christians in some fashion. But I will not sit here and preach at you or preach to you and say, well, you need to go back to church. Well, blah, 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 blah. You know what? Most of us hear enough of that. And I understand that from experience when I've had to go through my... um, dark valleys of the soul, so to speak, when I've been in the wilderness. And people don't get a lot of encouragement when that happens. That does not usually make people go back to church. You know what makes people go back to church if they're going to? Encouragement from people that are in the church that don't pressure them. Unconditional love. Somebody who listens. Somebody who cares. Somebody who is trauma-informed. And if they're not trauma-informed, they're at least willing to try. And if you're around a person like that, and they're a part of a larger community that's like that, or at least a large, I don't like to use the word faction, but a large group of people in the church that have a lot of influence and pull in the church are like that, that can make such a difference. And so in combining faith and the healing journey, I understand that it gets complicated. And I understand that there are people where church has been your foundation, it's been your inspiration, and you've never had to sever that relationship. And you've been able to either compartmentalize that in some way, or you are fortunate to live in a, to be in a church where you feel comfortable and you feel safe, and it works in your overall journey. And if that's the case, then that is great. Keep doing what you're doing. And Allow that community to be part of your healing journey, whether directly or indirectly. But I personally think that faith, 
should have a spirituality component to it. And what I mean by that is that we have specific spiritual practices, and it's not just about religious ritual, even though I um, actually grew up Southern Baptist and then became an Episcopalian, and now I go to an online church that's neither of those. But I find that there should be a practical component to our faith that is part of the healing journey. I've always emphasized that we need to have our faith separate from our healing journey in the sense that they're not compartmentalized necessarily, but we need to have that time with God that's for that reason, that we need to have a component of our faith that's in of itself for itself. Because the healing work doesn't need to become our God, so to speak. You know, that becomes idolatry. And so the thing is, is to be careful about making your practice your only connection to Christ and to God. And if that makes sense. And not having practices and experiences that are just that. Just connecting with God and building your faith and working on your Christian journey. There's a part of that that should be just that, I believe. Now, it could be that it's sort of like a, 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 what's the word, a spectrum where part of it is clearly this, and then there's some where it's mixed, and then there's some where it's just the healing journey, even though your faith might inform it. Does that make sense? So, I... um. You know, I understand that a lot of this stuff, you know, like if you're doing prayer and you're using a prayer to help you maybe go through the ACORN technique, for example. The ACORN technique is the steps to help you process difficult emotions. And you can find that on the Christian Emotional Recovery website. You can find that on rachelleroy.com and you can get that resource. And um, there's also the meditations on YouTube that are free and you can also buy them and they're yours forever so you can download and you can listen to them anytime whether you have internet or not in the Christian Emotional Recovery Store but that's the Acorn Meditations and the point is the Acorn Meditations can help you connect with God and with Christ in the process and if you were to do something that was like that but it was a prayer not necessarily the guided meditation Well, that is combining your faith with your healing journey. And like I said, there needs to be a practical component to our faith. You know, faith shouldn't just be about practicing religion and then it doesn't apply to our lives in any way. Or we follow these rules, but there's no real, I don't want to say benefit. That sounds really bad because the whole point is that we serve Christ, not the other way around, right? But Christ is also a servant. He came to be a servant to the people. He came to love us and to show us the way. And so if we follow Christ, then if we're broken then we, including Christ in this healing journey in practical and applicable healing ways, it makes sense. You know, Jesus was a practical guy. He would want us to apply his truths to our healing journey. So I don't think you can completely separate your faith from your healing journey. But I've gotten a lot of people who have said, but Rachel, I... You know, I I went to church, and I would pray, and I would read the Bible, and I would do all that stuff. You know, all the typical things that modern American Christians are told that they're supposed to do. And yeah, we are. But, you know, this is the interpretation of Scripture that we have now. Other cultures have different practices and different interpretations and they do some of that but they also do other things and even within christianity in the united states you've got catholics and you've got episcopalians and you've got lutherans and baptists and methodists and non-denominational people and pentecostals and it just goes on and on and how they interpret what you practice as a christian varies Most um, modern interpretations say we go to a building once a week. We observe the Sabbath on a Sunday. Some people do it on a Saturday. Jewish people do it on a Saturday, for example. 
and then we go to a sermon or a talk or a um you know a, a homily or something and then maybe we take communion either up front or in our seats some sundays and then maybe we sing and maybe we give an offering. Maybe there's a laying on of hands or testimonies. Um, usually there's some kind of like, you know, singing praise or something of that nature. Sometimes there's a speaker who may do some other kind of practice in the sermon. But it's all very formal and there's a certain structure to it. And so I understand that praying and reading our Bible and going to church, if that's something that we're able to do, the last one, is all part of the process of being a Christian. That There has to be some kind of practice in place, right? Um, if you don't go to a formal church, maybe you do some of that on your own. Maybe you have a daily devotional and you read scripture and you pray. Maybe you have quiet time with God. Maybe um, what I've done a lot in the past is have a praise and worship where I would just do that on my own for an hour or 45 minutes. And it would sort of be this meditative and I would sing and listen to certain songs and meditate on them. Um, and there's just a lot of different combinations of that. And there is a benefit to when we go deep into those practices and they're genuine and we connect with God. It's powerful and it does heal our minds. It activates our vagus nerve, which is that sort of calming center in the brain. So there's a lot of research that shows that active and engaged prayer and that having a religious practice and meeting with a religious community, if it's healthy, every week actually has health and mental health benefits. So can praying and meditating and going to church help you heal? Yes. And for some people, if it's a retreat and if they have a great um, Christian community that's supporting them and they can be open about it and people are praying for them and they're understanding and they're not pressuring them, it can actually be a powerful source of healing your community. But Unfortunately, that's not always how it works, and I understand that. And so I um, had this experience myself, and I'm sure that a majority of you can relate to this in some way and on some level where you would have a family member or somebody in the church. You would take the risk and at least share a little bit of the trauma you were going through, the depression, the anxiety, the PTSD, the um, OCD, the eating disorder, the um, neuro neurodiverse experience that you might be struggling with and they might just tell you in some cases out of malice and childishness and narcissism in most cases out of well-meaning misguided um, feedback they would say oh well you're probably just not praying hard enough or well you know you're probably just not reading the bible enough or you just don't have enough faith or you just need to wait on god or god is teaching you something in this experience now that last one there could be truth to that but to say that that's the only reason that it happened spits in the face of a person's experience when they're genuinely hurting and it's amazing how incredibly insensitive and uninformed and ignorant people in the church can be I'm just going to say it. You know, it's amazing how even in this society where we're throwing around words like narcissistic abuse and gaslighting, those two words have become mainstream only in the last couple of years. But there are still a lot of people that don't understand trauma and the nature of trauma and how it impacts people. And that's what needs to become mainstream. People need to become educated. I've always thought it was strange that we teach kids algebra and history and reading and writing all things that they need to know to be a good citizen right but we don't teach kids emotional intelligence we in a totally different thing we don't teach them to balance a checkbook and change the oil in a car and you know all the practical things but one of the practical things that we need to learn in life is how to deal with adversity how to be resilient how to set goals how to um, practically apply our faith how to, you know, you know, I wish churches would educate people and, and, and there was a component of the church that was more like that. Not at the exclusion of teaching people about the ministry of Christ and the Great Commission and praising God and learning about church history and learning about Christian history and learning the Bible. People are so uninformed about the Bible, even in churches now, they don't know the Bible. 
That's important, but there needs to be more of an educational component of both of those in the church, and I think that's what we're missing, and that's why I'm feeling in the gap here in this podcast. Now, I don't teach Bible history. I'm not a scholar. Okay, I am a scholar, but I'm not a Bible scholar. I teach English and composition and creative writing and college skills, and I love that. And sometimes what I do in the classroom, I teach online technically, but I'll bring it into what I do here, right? A lot of those skills. And so they overlap. And what I'm just saying is, is I think that churches need to be more trauma-informed. I know a lot of churches have like AA meetings in their basements that might not be directly affiliated with the church, but I think churches need to start having programs where they educate people about trauma, where they teach people that are survivors of trauma practices that they can learn to help them combine their faith in practical and applicable ways with healing strategies that can help them to grow and help them to get past their trauma. And, you know, it's, it's a complicated thing, like I said, and I would never say that that should be a substitute for traditional practices. That's not what I'm saying, but I'm saying that practicing our faith and combining that with our healing journey is kind of the foundation of this podcast. And so that's why I say you need to have a daily practice. And everybody's different. And I'm not going to say, well, you need to do 10 minutes of this and 30 minutes of that. Not everybody has that kind of time. I get it. You know, and we all slack. And, you know, I'm trying now to get back into Bible study because I feel like there's a lot of things that we've been taught that are incorrect. And I'm trying to get, like, learn the correct translations. I'm not learning Hebrew and Greek, but just knowing, is this how it was actually intended? Is this how it was written? I'm trying to learn, you know, um, practical um, applications of Scripture. I'm trying to learn more about church history because that's something that we don't learn. We act like the Bible is just this static thing where it was written and then it just cut off at the last verse of the Bible. But it's this, the Bible is a living, breathing document and church history continued all the way from the time that the Bible was written until now. And we need to understand where we come from, right? I'm not one of these people that believes in censoring history. I think we should learn all of it, the good, the bad, the ugly, in full color with the truth. We don't need to sweep the truth under the rug no matter what it is. The good is there. The bad is there and the ugly is there. It's all real, right? I believe in holistic approaches to everything. When it comes to our faith, we should be finding ways to combine our faith with our healing practices And there also, like I said, needs to be a component of our faith that is a little bit separate from that because this isn't just about us. This isn't just about our healing journey. This is about God. And that's important to remember. I know that. You know, just in this talk, I felt like it was laid on my heart to talk a little bit about the relationship between our healing practices, and our faith? Where do we draw the line? How do we actually live that? How do we engage in that? What is that for us? You know, and I can't answer that completely for you, but I can give you some pointers and some guidelines that I feel on my heart. And so, you know, I've tried to share a few of those that, like I said, there needs to be a component of our faith that's just that, that we can use our faith to Um, in practical ways to help us to do the healing work and the daily practices and that it's okay to experiment with and try different things based in science as well. That's another one. You know, one of the reasons I started this um, channel was because I saw some very, very strict fundamental um, people and groups that meant well, but they would have these lists and say, you can't meditate ever under any circumstances. You cannot do this and that kind of practice ever under any circumstances. And it wasn't like even like really woo-woo, weird, out there stuff like tarot cards and astrology and talking to the dead and stuff we know we probably shouldn't do, right? But it was like stuff like meditation, no matter what kind it was, or um, you shouldn't go see a therapist. That's insane. That is insane. 
we it, that is one reason I started this podcast. That is literally when I had it on my heart, God was saying, I want you to start a podcast. I want you to start a podcast. And I was like, God, I cannot do that. I'm scared. I can't be seen. I don't want to offend anybody. I don't like putting myself out there. And it just would not go away. And so I finally decided to start the podcast. And one thing that finally pushed me over the edge and made me start the first episode was, I won't even name a certain teacher, had this list that she put up. And it was ridiculous, some of the stuff on it. Some of the stuff on it I agreed with. And I understand that every Christian probably draws the line in a little bit of a different place. And it's kind of like that scripture. Now, this scripture can get overused, but that scripture about eating meat from sacrificed animals in the temple. And basically, Paul says something like, you need to do what is on your heart to do in that situation. And don't give this person a hard time if that's what they um, choose to do, if it's something different. And it's kind of like that. I think with a lot of these practices... It's like you need to let people have the freedom within reason to do what they feel that God is putting on their heart. And you need to do the same and just kind of stay in your lane and mind your own business kind of thing. And that's kind of what I practice and preach here. I don't preach, but I teach here. And so it's like if meditation is something you don't feel like you should be doing, then don't do it. But if somebody else's life has been completely changed by it, and they might, might not even be here if it weren't for meditation, then just, you know, say, good for you. I, I don't fully understand that. That's not my experience. Namaste. God bless. And move on with your life. And, I mean, I'm just going to say it. Mind your own business. That's why in my group, I'll say something like, I have these group rules where I'm like, if somebody doesn't exactly believe what you believe, Leave them alone. Don't harass them. Um, somebody may have a different experience than you, and it's okay to share a different experience. Okay, that's fine. It's okay to give and, and receive advice and ask questions and share a gentle, kind opinion. But it's one another thing to say, well, you shouldn't do that. If it's something that's not obviously wrong, and it's something that is helping that person... You know, um, when I say not obviously wrong, I'm talking about stuff like therapy and meditation and other practices, somatic practices, because on that list were a lot of those things. And if there were um, people actually follow that list to a T, all Christians, a lot of Christians would probably, I'm just going to say it, be gone because they would not be here. And it's sometimes unconventional and unorthodox practices that have helped a lot of people heal. And um, I just, I remember this story, and it stuck in my mind for some reason, and I think I've shared it before, and there was, it was a sermon I heard from somebody, and I can't remember who it was, but he talked about the fact that there was this church, and this guy had some kind of a bone or muscle disease, and he was, you know, walking around and functioning, and then he started to get bent over and, um, crippled with some kind of arthritis or something and he was in so much pain that he had trouble walking and it finally got to the point where he could still stand up and walk but he was in a wheelchair and he had tried everything he had tried like physical therapy and prayer and he had tried exercise and conventional stretching and nothing would heal him he tried medications and so somebody in the church gently um, he knew they knew somebody that taught yoga a specific kind of yoga and so they said well, why don't you try yoga and he was very hesitant about it because he cared about his faith and his relationship with people in the church and he cared about what God thought most of all so he went and talked to his pastor who was a kind man and his pastor said well if it helps you and you've tried everything else then do the yoga and so he did yoga and it helped him. And over the course of a few weeks, he was able to get out of the wheelchair and he was still in pain. A few more weeks later, I'm not saying it totally cured him, but he was more back to his old self. And yoga was the only thing that in his case, I'm not saying that's true of everybody like him, that that was the only thing that helped him to heal. And he got his life back. And people in the church found out 
that he had been doing yoga and that the preacher had encouraged him to do it if that's what he felt in his heart he needed to do and he had tried everything else and he had prayed about it. And the people in the church, some of them shunned them, some of them left the church, some of them um, wouldn't talk to him anymore, And but there were a lot of people that left the church over that. The guy got healed and felt better. Was he supposed to stay crippled and bent over in a wheelchair in pain if he had a way to get out of his wheelchair? That is not to be disrespectful to anybody who can't get out of a wheelchair. We're all on our journey where we're at, and we love everybody no matter where they're at. But this was this guy's particular situation, and... I just can, I just, this is just my opinion, but I, th- I think that that is the most unchrist like and unchristian response you could possibly have. The guy should have stayed bent over in a wheelchair in pain when he could find a way to get his life back because you don't think he should do yoga? I'm sorry, no. If you don't want to do yoga, then don't do yoga. But those people were wrong, in my opinion. That's one of those cases where you need to give somebody a little bit of grace. And like I said, anything goes. No, anything doesn't go. That's not what I'm saying. Also with yoga, there's a lot of people that will do the stretches and the breathing. And they'll do the namastes, but they don't necessarily combine it with the Eastern religion. And that's also another thing that people don't realize. And, you know, it's a lot of, there's a lot of complexity there is what I'm saying. And there's a lot of gray area. And that's why I'm saying show yourself some grace and show other people some grace in this process. Should we still discern? Absolutely, yes. There are people that are convicted that they shouldn't do yoga. Don't do yoga then. Great. That's not for you. But if somebody else does, that's not your business. Mind your own business. Stay in your lane and be like, okay, whatever, and move on. It's just like that scripture about the meats in the temple. Um, If prayer and reading scripture and going to church is not enough to heal you, you do not need to feel bad. I'll say it again. If prayer and reading scripture and going to church and singing is not enough to heal you, that is not your fault. You need to get to the root of the trauma. You need to include practices that will actually get to the root of the trauma and help you heal. That might include going to a therapist, writing in a journal, doing somatic body work, meditation, yoga, It might include other somatic practices um, and different types of therapies like talk therapy, EMDR, ART, which is advanced, rapid, I forgot. But there are different therapies here that might include internal family systems, inner child work. I could just list all the systems out there, but I'm not going to. There's hundreds. And I've covered a lot of them this season in the podcast because I want people to have as many options as possible. Now, that's not to overwhelm you and for you to try all of them, but you need to figure out where am I at? What would, you know, sometimes if you just kind of listen inside, God will tell you What kind of therapy will help you? What resonates with you? What has energy for you? And sometimes that's God telling you that inner voice that is God telling you, try this. And, you know, test it. You don't have to just listen to a voice and trust it. That's not what I'm saying. But you test the spirits, right? And you also uh, discern. And so there's a sort of instinctual intuitive that that sort of gift that God gave us component to it but then there's also a logical component to it where we read scripture and we discern and if we feel like we need to get some advice about it we get advice about it from somebody who won't just shoot us down not necessarily that they'll agree with us either though right um but gets advice from somebody who's wise and trusted and shows people a little grace and you need to find communities like that And, you know, if you're at a church that's really strict, I don't encourage you to live a double life. That's not what I'm saying. But keeping some of this stuff private is another option that you have. Know that nobody, you don't have to tell anybody that you're doing some of these practices if you feel like that they might not understand. And you might be at a church where it's a little stricter and you're, it's working for you. You go to a church where the people are good people and, you know, it's a good place but maybe they don't agree with some of the stuff that you might be doing that is a little more in the gray area, so to speak. Again, I'm not saying live a double life. I'm not saying go against what your congregation or what your church says. 
But I'm also a proponent of we should respect our pastors, but where do you draw the line at that and unquestioningly following everything they say? You've got to have a mind of your own. You've got to... You, you see all these documentaries coming out where you have these churches where they're really strict and the preachers have unquestioningly authority over everything. And to me, that is dangerous and that is toxic. And that's why a lot of churches, especially the stricter ones, are a ripe environment for abuse and for trauma. It's There's a lot of layers to why that's the case, but part of it is because they won't let you do a lot of these healing practices. Part of it is because there's been abuse and they cover it up and they sweep it under the rug. And part of it is because they invalidate the victims and uphold the authority figures. And in my opinion, in my opinion, it should be the other way around. People that are called of God are not called to take power, unquestioning power. They're called to be servants. And they're called to serve the people of the church and to love them. And they might be a shepherd. And they might be a shepherd and they might lead. But they do not have unquestioning authority. You have a right to question them. You have a right to read the Bible for yourself and interpret it. This is not the Middle Ages. We don't go through priests to, to get forgiveness. We go through Christ. It's a personal relationship. And you are always free to walk away from a church and try another one. Do not be intimidated or afraid of anybody that tries to tell you otherwise. Because we are free agents and God gave us agency. And if you're in a church where you don't, your agency is not respected, then you need to go to another church, period. So I'm not speaking against any particular church. There are some churches that I am against. I'll, I'll just be honest. Um, this is just my personal opinion. I, I don't like churches that oppress women. I don't like churches that um, are racist. And, and there's just a lot of components to... You know, these issues are complicated, okay? But what I'm saying is that you have agency, you have autonomy, and that God gave it to you, and that you should respect the authority of people in the church. But at the same time, you can keep your agency, have a mind of your own, question, and think for yourself. Why would God have given you a brain if he didn't want you to use it? So just keep that in mind, too. So when it comes to practicing your faith and going on this healing journey and doing those practices, there is a spectrum, I think, where, you know, I hope that all of the practices you do that are separate from your healing practices can help you heal and that it's just a byproduct of that. But you do it because you worship God and you follow God and you love God. And then there might be some things where you sort of combine them. And then there might be some more non-religious things that you do to help you heal as well. And it's okay to do a range of all of those. That's what I'm saying. And it takes time and it's a lot of work and it takes a lot of energy and it sucks that we have to do all this. You know, I think everybody needs to do things for their mental health though. And it's not like there's this clear cut line where you've got people that suffer from trauma and people that don't. I think we all have a little bit of trauma and there are people that disagree, but I think everybody could use therapy at some point in their life. They go through something, everybody has emotional issues, everybody has unresolved emotional issues, and yes, a little bit of unresolved trauma, even if they don't have PTSD, right? And I think that this work can benefit everybody, but it's especially the people that survived different types of abuse and neglect and traumatic events and adverse childhood experiences that... In, you know, manipulative, toxic people in relationships. You get the idea that need to do this healing work. And whether it's fair or not, that's the reality. You have to do the work if you're going to heal. And that's why I always encourage people, but I also try to gently push them forward. And in my group, I don't want people just wallowing around in self-pity and saying the same things over and over and over again. Now, I'm not... Uh, that's I try to be very careful when I say that. I'm not trying to be insensitive because I've been there and I've done that. I've been guilty of that. I understand. But there has to be a time where you're like, look, is this being productive? And you feel your emotions. You don't invalidate them. And you show yourself grace. And it takes time to go through this process. What I'm saying is, is that overall, you need to be moving forward and being productive and having some resilience. 
and being kind and gentle to yourself is actually that process. And we're actually taught the opposite. That's why it's, I go deep into the nature of some of this stuff and talk about it in ways that a lot of people haven't because nobody did that. And I would get just this little thread of something and I'd be like, wait, 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 wait. And I would go back and listen to it like 10 times. And I'm like, why don't people talk about this more? This is what I need. This is the clue that I need. And I would go and investigate and dig and draw out more and talk about it with myself and just kind of snowball it until it became this full-blown concept that could help me heal with an insight that nobody had ever shown me before. And so that's kind of what I try to do on this podcast. And so the whole point of this talk, I didn't have a um, script for this one, or I don't use scripts, but like an outline. So um, I hope that this talk has given you some nuggets, some Um, truths, some encouragement, just, but I just wanted to talk about the nature of integrating your faith and your healing journey, and just some of the observations that I've had and experiences I've had. Some of this is just my opinion. Take it with a grain of salt. You don't have to agree. Part of my thing about being Christian is that I try to keep an open mind and be humble about what I believe, and not throw what I believe in other people's faces. I share it, But I don't force it down your throat because that's not my place. I'm not God. I know that. I could get any of it wrong. I know that too. And so please show me the same kind of grace that I'm trying to show you on this journey. That I could get something wrong because I'm human. And if I do, please forgive me. But I'm just trying to be human and real and honest with you and help you on this healing journey in a way that I feel like would be more Christ-like than, unfortunately, in my opinion, a good portion of Christians can sometimes be, unfortunately. I'm not judging Christians all around, but there's just so much harshness and judgment and, um, like I said, the opposite of grace. People are not trauma-informed, but on this podcast, you're safe, you're loved, we will show you grace, We will be kind to you. If something is wrong, we may say it one time gently. But what you're doing on this healing journey is between you and God. And God's got your back and he will also set you straight. He will. He sets me straight all the time. But know that you are loved and know that this healing journey is difficult. And it's okay to struggle. And it's okay to be human and have emotions and to screw up and to make mistakes and to not know what the heck you're doing and to figure this out as you go because that is the nature of it and that's okay. Thank you so much for listening. God bless you. Have a great day. And remember, beloveds, you are fearfully and wonderfully made and God loves you. Thank you so much for tuning in to this week's episode of Christian Emotional Recovery, hosted by Rachel Leroy. For links to this week's resources and to join the discussion, check out this episode's show notes at christianemotionalrecovery.com, where you can also find links to our YouTube channel and Facebook group. Join our email list and get other episodes and resources. If you enjoyed the podcast, please rate and review the podcast and tell a friend who may benefit from this message. See you next time. And remember, beloveds, God loves you and you are fearfully and wonderfully made.